Good morning, everybody. I love it when the message has already been spoken before I get up here. And, and, the, and it's been spoken and sung. So I just sort of um, glide into this place of, uh, of truth. So uh, before I begin, and, uh, and I want to welcome everyone, but I want to welcome especially people who are here for the very first time. What a great, great Sunday for you to be here for the first time. And we have um, our newcomer goddess right over here and another newcomer goddess right here. For those of you who are here for the first time, we have a little packet for you. So just raise your hand until you get something in it. And then uh, you'll be um, warmly welcomed. So uh, welcome everyone. You're here at the Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living, and our mission and vision are right up here, awakening personal transformation and teaching tools for positive change. So that's what I am about. That's what we're all, all about this morning. The, the global vision that we have for our entire year is co-creating a world that works for everyone. And so, given the uh, events of, the, of last week and a few weeks before that, it seems that we have a lot of work to do, and we're in the right place to do it. So, um, the July theme is very important, and if we just did the July theme, we would be creating a world that works for everyone. The July theme is this, loving kindness and forgiveness. So, uh, when, which one would you rather be, the kitty or the puppy? You know, I mean, it's like, um, if we did this, we would have a world that works for everyone. So, given this uh, theme of loving kindness and forgiveness, I want to draw your attention to this wonderful altar that Maya did this morning. And so, there's nature there, there's the Buddha there, filled with peace, and apples from her tree. And she is giving them away to you, so whoever gets here... For the dozen apples, um, they're from Armaya. So, you know, every week uh, there is some material that comes from home office, and I include some of it in each of my talks. And, and this quote, um, actually from our founder, Ernest Holmes, is um, relevant today, I believe. And it is, what untold grief of heart might be relieved by words of cheer and forgiveness. And so that echoes the theme for July, of course, loving kindness and forgiveness. But as I want to do, I rewrite the, uh, the quote. And so this is how I have rewritten it. What untold grief of heart might be relieved by words of cheer, forgiveness, loving kindness, trust, oneness, connection, and peace. We've had a lot of heartbreak and grief this week. And um, I've done a lot of uh, thinking, praying, reading, meditating on this. And what seems to be healthy for us all is to feel it first. Uh, feel it first and then to turn to the healing idea. Uh, Marianne Williamson, in her book, The Healing of the Soul of America, wrote this. There are many uncried tears in this country. And every day we cut off crying them, we simply create more tears for our children to cry later. Healing any area begins to heal them all. And so we are about healing starting wherever we are so that we can heal into whatever topic you want to heal into today. And I actually began seeing a shift when I looked, when I watched the news, and when I looked out into the social media, um, the newscasters could not keep reporting the tragedies without also reporting what people out there said. And what they said was that trust needs to be restored. We are really all one. And this was on national news. This was on local news. This is people saying, we need to come together now. Um, I heard a story on the local news about a little girl in Detroit who spent her birthday money 
making lunches for the police in Detroit. And, and the newscaster said, this is what needs to happen. And so on my Facebook, you know, I always bring you something. I think the spirit goes right through my Facebook. This morning, this morning, this came from Rumi. Love is the bridge between you and everything. Love is the bridge between you and everything. And here's another story that has been shared as of this morning. It's been shared 228 times. This came from a black woman who writes, So this morning I went into a convenience store to get a protein bar. As I walked through the door, I noticed that there were two white police officers, one about my age and the other several years older, talking to the clerk, an older white woman, behind the counter about the shootings that have gone on these past few days. They all looked at me and fell silent. I went about my business to get what I was looking for. As I turned back up the aisle to go pay, the oldest officer was standing at the top of the aisle watching me. As I got closer, he asked me, how I was doing. I replied, okay, and you? He looked at me with a strange look and asked me, how are you really doing? I looked at him and said, I'm tired. His reply was, me too. Then he said, I guess it's not easy being either one of us right now. I said, no, it is not. Then he hugged me, and I cried. I had never seen that man before in my life. I have no idea why he was moved to talk to me. What I know is that he and I shared a moment this morning that was absolutely beautiful. No judgments, no justifications, just two people sharing a moment. So that is your inspiration from Facebook this morning. <laughs> um, so my darlings, healing a life or healing the world requires the, sh the same shift in consciousness. And Bob read about the shift in consciousness in his quote, and Scott recited his own original poetry about that shift of consciousness in his sharing this morning. So whether the hurt is small, a small oversight from someone, or whether it is huge, like healing our entire country, it, is, it involves moving from the problem to the awareness of goodness. And although there are other people who work on policy, other people who work on governing, other people who work on uh, parenting, we, in this community, work in consciousness. And the work that we do for ourselves, we do for the entire world. So today, we are going to be looking at how words of cheer, forgiveness, loving kindness, trust, oneness, and connection can all be lumped into the quality of God that I'm calling peace. Sometimes all of these life-giving qualities get lumped up into love, sometimes get lumped up into joy. But today, I'm talking about peace of mind. And the title of my talk is this. What if our only goal was peace of mind? What if our only goal was peace of mind? That's all we sought, and we sought it constantly. And, and we did whatever we needed to do to get there. What if, no matter what happened, each one of us had the spiritual skill to shift to peace of mind? Now, that does not mean putting our head in the sand. It does not mean ignoring what is happening in the world. But it is developing some techniques that we could see into the world and hold its goodness. That we could look at what is happening and look beyond it to see the goodness that is inherent in everything. Because as Posey prayed, God is the only thing that's going on. What if peace of mind were so supremely important to us that everything we did and said and thought and shared and how and when we meditated and how and when we ate sugar or didn't eat sugar or whatever we do as practice 
for healthy living? What if all of that was done in the name of establishing and keeping peace in our hearts? What if whenever we felt fearful or angry or in lack or in separation or in judgment, we stopped and practiced spiritual skills until we relaxed into peace of mind. When we say that we teach tools for positive change, these are the tools that I'm talking about because if we don't teach these tools, what good are any tools? And so... What I want to talk about this morning is single-pointed awareness. The single-pointed awareness of peace of mind. And although we can do this selfishly, and I mean, I want to be a peace of mind for myself. But because we're all connected, as we do this for ourselves, we do this for everyone. We put something into race consciousness, as we call it, or the universal subconscious that creates a little more peace of mind out there that is available to everyone. And so as we do these techniques that are selfish in that it makes me and hopefully you more peaceful in the face of some very disturbing things in the world, what happens is our thought becomes creative in a positive way. It becomes healing of ourselves and others. It becomes restoring to that peace that passes understanding. It becomes spiritually responsible rather than spiritually negligent when we pass on the stories of how bad it is. That is spiritual negligence. When we pass on the stories of how bad it is rather than using these tools and passing on peace of mind. So as I was thinking about this, as I was thinking about the single-pointedness of peace of mind, what came to me, and I just want to see it of hands, how many know this book, The Kin of Atta Are Waiting for You? Well, some more of you need to know this book. The Kin of Atta Are Waiting for You. It, oh, but it's on Amazon. It is on Amazon. I, yeah, yeah, I looked it up. Yes, we're going to get some. We're going to get some. So, Jane, Jane, or Dorothy Bryant. Dorothy Bryant is the author. Dorothy Bryant was born in 1930, and she lives in San Francisco, and this made her famous in 1971. This is a fantasy allegory of what's happening in our world today. That is why I was so drawn to this. And I know people that read this every few years just because it reminds you, me, us of the truth in a way that is a story. So the story is that, and I won't give anything away, but the story is that there is a very selfish man. He's worse than selfish. He's psychopathic and sociopathic and he's a bad guy. And he has an accident. He has a very bad car accident and thinks he's going to die, but en ends up, you know, losing consciousness and waking up in a fantasy. He doesn't know it's a fantasy place. He thinks he's uh, been taken to a commune. Uh, this is 1971. How precious is that? So he thinks he's been taken to a commune where there are these uh, people that look kind of like natives. And um, uh, of all races, by the way, and uh, they don't speak English. They speak what seems like a very, very simple language on the surface, but as he stays there a long time, he starts learning the language and realizing that it is an extremely complex language, and on the surface, the culture seems very, very simple. At depth, it is very, very complex. And the thing about this culture is that they do everything to dream the highest dreams. And these are nighttime dreams. Nighttime dreams, that everything, how much they work, what they eat, how they interact with each other, um, what their choices are. Every single choice point is based on how good my dreams are going to be tonight. And then those dreams are reported to the tribe the next day. So this man who's caught in this culture says... 
Um, there was no question about it, no doubt that all, all that for these people, reality consisted of dreams, and their waking life was an illusion. So for them, the most real thing was the dreams, and the waking life was the illusion. And so the simple focus of life was how to dream the highest dreams. And so the first word that this guy learned in this culture was this word, which is uh, nagdeo. The word nagdeo, which was a greeting, a prayer, a benediction, whatever, roughly meant something like good dreams. But not really that. It was something more like valuable dreams or enlightening dreams. To call something nagdeo, was to say that it was not productive of good, valuable, or enlightening dreams, which showed the way back home. All kinds of things were donagdeo. Anger was donagdeo, and so was eating too much, or not eating enough, or talking too much. The list grew and grew. But beyond that, every act had become ritualized to serve the dramas of their dream life, which in turn dictated their waking life. So what these people learned how to do is to apply every single thing in their life to high dreaming. And what I'm asking us to do in the allegory sense of this book, and I encourage you all to go to the bookstore and order it, and we'll get it for you, is to measure everything that we do in life to benefit our peace of mind. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through some general categories. These are the staging areas of the pain in our lives. These are the staging areas of the blessings in our lives. And we're going to look at what we can do to establish peace of mind. And of course you know it is an inside job. We change the way we look at these things. We dream a different dream on the inside. And we change the world of effects. So, ready for this? Okay. Here we go. Anybody with relationship pain? This is the pain of the of the social relationships, personal relationships, romantic relationships, relationships with kids, with parents, with bosses, anything. So there is a way, there is a pathway from relationship hurt to relationship peace. And the Donna Deo things, the what you don't want to do, is what comes naturally to a lot of us. Condemnation, nurturing anger, retribution, comparison, judgment, and rehearsing arguments. That's a big one for me. I drive a lot. Rehearsing arguments (laughs) that I think might happen. So it's so natural, isn't it? It's kind of... um, It's it's natural, and and yet it is not spiritually responsible to think that things are going to get better if we think about the arguments we're going to have and justify them. If we had single mind focus on our own peace of mind instead of changing that one, we we could look for an idea that would lead us into peace of mind. Now I have mine. I'm going to share with you mine But you need to get yours yourself because guess what? My peace of mind maybe has a different pathway to get there than yours. So here is my idea that I that heals this for me, and that is we are all precious beings in interesting disguises. We are all we all have God at our center. This is kind of a quote from Mother Teresa where she says, There goes another child of God in such an interesting disguise. What I have to focus on is the preciousness of each person and not the disguise. But, I mean, if I'm seeing the disguise, I can say, okay, in there, in there, in there is the precious being that I don't need to judge. I can give this person to God and I can see the preciousness of this person. So you see how this is creative, healing, restoring, connecting, and spiritually responsible. Do you see that? So I want you to find your idea 
that you can put in your heart when you tend to judge and condemn somebody else that you're in a relationship with. So we're going to go through these, you know, at kind of a 100,000 feet here, but you get the idea. It all works. So let's say you've got health and body issues. Anybody <coughs> been mad at their body ever? <laughs> if we're going like this. <laughs> so we, we know that it's really good to love our body unconditionally, but... How many people have the shape, the condition, the size, the health status, the physical capability, not to our liking, and so we get mad at our bodies. And this creates distress and unhappiness. And you know, there are people that fight with their bodies the whole time they're in them. The entire time they're in their bodies, they are fighting with them. Instead of loving them. And this is my, I mean... Where do you think all of these ideas came from? For me. Me and my issues. My body healing quote is this. My body is my soul's perfect vehicle just as it is. This is spiritually responsible. This is loving towards my body. This brings me peace of mind. And this is what we, you know, right on the inside of our eyelids... Whenever we roll our eyes and condemn our body because we're looking in the mirror. Next. Money and supply fear to money and supply peace. We're not particularly taught to be satisfied. Even in this philosophy, we are always asked, what do we want? Indicating that we don't have it now. And so we go into um, spiritual work feeling a lack rather than feeling grateful. By the way, if you, if you get a glimpse of something that you might want to work on, go and you don't know what the next step is, please get a prayer from a practitioner at the end of this service because you know they don't have your stuff going on in their hearts and minds. They are trained to help you find this next idea. So, if we could if we could focus on sufficiency, if we could know that just as the next breath of ours is there, we don't even have to think about it, we just relax the rib cage and the next breath of air is given to us, that what we require in life to fulfill our purpose is there. So, the peace of mind idea that is mine is this. All I need comes to me. This is spiritually responsible. This is healing. This is connecting. This is not keeping your good at bay. This is opening to your good, which is exactly what we want to do. Yes? Yes. Okay, here's the biggie for today. And I got a really, I got this one. I want you to know I got this one for us. And that is world environmental political, and survival dread to absolute peace of mind. Okay? I have conversations every week about the environment with people, about the political process with people, about violence in America, about Brexit, about all all this stuff, and so, ready? Okay. Ilya Prigany. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Ilya Prigany was a Nobel Prize winning Belgian chemist. And this is what Ilya Prigany researched. He has a book called Order Out of Chaos. And this is what it says on Amazon. This book shows how the two great themes of classical science, order and chaos, which coexisted uneasily for centuries, are being reconciled in a new and unexpected synthesis. So what this means is, and this is true of chemistry, and this is true of the melting pot of the world. When you have a system that is in chaos, which very well could be our country right now, 
If you add energy to it, if you feed into, if it, uh, uh, like if you bring it to a boiling point, it will snap into a new level of order. This is what happens chemically, and, and you, so you have a, a solution that isn't, isn't coalescing, and you, you boil it, you add energy, add energy, and add energy to it, and it snaps into a new level of order. It's what happens with mayonnaise. <laughs> It does, if you've ever made mayonnaise, you've got the egg and you've got the oil, and if you stir that up, it is disgusting. But if you add the right kind of energy, it, it snaps into this velvety emulsion. So what is happening in our world today is that energy is being added to this chaotic system. It is unstable. A system that is unstable is more affectable. It is more able to be changed. This is the time that we add love and peace of mind to this system every day, all the time. And I actually have been working on this with every crazy quote that I hear out of some candidate's mouth. I say, energy into the system, this is great. Energy into the system, this is great. And then I practice love and peace. This is what we are called to do right now. And so... This is the quote that keeps me sane. The system's energy is rising to be transformed in a way that benefits all. In the Bible, when it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, this is exactly it. Enough of us have to have our minds renewed to love and peace, and then our system will snap into a new level of order of love and peace. It can be no other way. But you don't have the luxury anymore of telling the stories that are dysfunctional. Telling the stories. Yes. Yes. Telling the stories of what you don't want to have happen. Telling how crazy this one is, this one is, this one. No. No more stories. You add love to the system. You add peace to the system. And if somebody's complaining to me, I'm saying this now. I'm, I am welcoming all of the energy that this system can hold because my love is being magnified by the system's energy rising. So remember our affirmation from last week that the world is changing and I am on the transformation team. Let's say that. The world is changing and I am on the transition team. So one of the things that you can do actually is write yourself a little three by five card. And, and the things that annoy you, like when I am annoyed at the news, and then you get your own transformative affirmation and write it really big on that card. When I look in the mirror and I don't like the way my cellulite looks. And then you have your affirmation that loves your body really big on that 3 by 5 card and you read it. So that you trip that loop that you get into, that creative loop of complaining. Because... We all have to add the positive stuff to the system so it pops into that new order of peace of mind. Alrighty then. My work is done here. <laughs> here are the spiritual principles. First of all, so important, my peace of mind is a product of my own consciousness. And... Peace is always given and available. So your spiritual practice that I want, I beg you to do, is this. Find a new idea that promotes peace of mind and embody it. (sighs) 
as we go into the inner work. Um, this, oh, who said this? This was on Facebook too. Hmm. Somebody wise. A small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. That was Gandhi. So as we turn within, fired up with the rise of energy of the system, we go into that place of peace of mind that is not restful. It is feisty. It is rich. It is energized. It is passionate. It is on fire. And those are the ideas that we install in our heart and our mind and our actions. We install them so permanently and so uh, positively that we could speak them in our sleep. That we love, respect, and honor every precious being on earth. That we love, respect, and honor this physical body that is our soul's vehicle. That we are so grateful for every single thing that sustains us, all manner of supply and good that sustains us. And that we are workers, workers on this planet to shift it into peace, love, and joy. And that is our mission. And we do it waking, sleeping, and dreaming. And so it is. Amen. Amen.